Woo. Hello. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is Tuesday. Something. Hold on. No, it's Wednesday. I didn't do a video yesterday. Why? Because I was in the hospital yesterday. Got home today. Woo. Or was it yesterday? No, no. I got home today. Praise the Lord. Um, I want, but we're on chapter three of the basic elements of the Christian life. See? Right? And we're on chapter three. The precious blood of Christ. I hope you enjoy reading with me. I enjoy reading to you. Okay. This is to sustain your physical life. You need certain basic items such as water, oxygen, food, clothing, and shelter. Right? We need that, right? We do. In addition, your body requires a certain amount of protein, vitamins, and minerals. Without all of these, your physical life would, would die or at least suffer greatly. That's true. Agree? Great. It is the same with your spiritual life. Just as your physical life, it's the same as your spiritual life. Your spiritual life, just like your physical life, requires certain basic elements. These, these are essential. Without them, you will find it difficult to serve, survive as a Christian in a world that does not know Christ. One of these basic elements is the blood of Christ. Why do you need the blood of Christ? Do you know? Why do we need the blood of Christ? Because essentially, fallen man has three basic problems. Even as a Christian, you still carry around the fallen human life. So day after day, you may still be plagued with these three problems. Hmm. These three problems involve three parties. God, yourself, and Satan. Toward God, you often sense separation. Within yourself, you often sense guilt. And from Satan, you often sense accusation. These three, separates, separation from God, feelings of guilt, and accusation from Satan, can be three big problems in your Christian life. How can these, how can these be overcome, or how can we overcome them? It's, only, it's by the blood of Christ. So the only way to over that these can be overcome is only by the blood of Christ. Okay, so, amen. Okay, separation from God. See, separation from God. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he immediately hid from God. Before Adam sinned, he enjoyed God and was in His presence all the time. Yet after he sinned. He hid. Sin always results in separation from God. Even as a Christian, you may experience this. I know I have. After committing some little sins, you sense a great guilt between you and God. Oh, a great gulf. I'm sorry. The light from the camera is like blinding me. You sense a great gulf, not guilt, gulf between you and God. Because God is righteous, he cannot tolerate sins. He cannot tolerate sins. This is what the prophet Isaiah said. No, Jehovah's hand is not so short that he cannot save. Nor is his ear so heavy that he cannot hear. But your inequities have become a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Isaiah 59, 1-2 so, after Adam sinned, God did not say, Adam, what have you done? Rather, God said, Adam, where are you? In other words, God is not as much concerned with what sins you may commit as he is with the fact that, you are, that, you, that your sins separate you from him. Lord Jesus. God loves you. He loves each and every one of us. God loves us. But he abhors your sins. He hates our sins. As long as your your sins remain, God must stay 
away. In this condition, you feel far from God. For God to come, sins must go. There is only one thing in the entire universe that can take away sins, and that's the precious blood of Christ. No amount of prayer, no amount of weeping, no ritual, no penance, no promise to do better, no guilty feeling, no period of waiting, no nothing but the precious blood of Christ can remove sins. Hebrews 9.22 says that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This illustrated in Exodus. This is illustrated in Exodus. Some of the children of Israel may have been as sinful as the Egyptians. Just the same as the Egyptians. Yet when God sent his angel to slay all the firstborn children in the land of Egypt, he did not say, When I see your good behavior, I will pass over you. God did not require that the children of Israel pray, do penance, or promise to behave. No. God commanded them to slay the Passover lamb and to sprinkle its blood on their doorpost. He said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's in Exodus 12, 13. God never looked to see what kind of people were in the house. When he saw the blood, he simply passed over. The Passover lamb was a picture of Christ. If you think about it, the, the picture of the Passover lamb, the, the Passover lamb is a picture of Christ. When John the Baptist first saw the Lord, he proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That's in John 1.29. Jesus is the Lamb of God. By his precious blood, all your sins have been taken away. What then should, should you do when you have sinned and feel far from God? What should you do? You tell me. What should you do? You should simply confess that sin to God and believe that the blood of Jesus has taken that sin away. That's what you need to do. That's what you must do. First, John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you confess your sins, immediately all distance between you and God is gone. All the distance between you and God. The separation between you and God has disappeared. Okay? It is gone. You don't have to worry about any feeling or lack of feeling at that point. The blood of Christ is primarily for God's satisfaction. Not for yours. It's for His, not yours. Remember God said, when I, when I not you, I, not you, See the blood. On the night of the Passover, the children of Israel were within the house while the blood of the Lamb was without. Within the house, they could not see the blood. Nevertheless, they had peace through knowing that God was satisfied with that blood. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest went alone into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood on the expiation cover of the ark. I don't know. Expiation. Expiation. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how to say that word. That's in Leviticus 16, 11 through 17. No one was allowed to watch. No one was allowed to go in there with him and watch. This is a shadow of Christ who, after his resurrection, went into the heavenly tabernacle and sprinkled his own blood before God as the preparation for our sins. You can read that in Hebrews 9, 12. No one today can look into heaven and see that blood. You're not going to be able to look into the heavens and see that blood. All right? Yet it is there. It's there. It is there speaking for you. Hebrews 12, 24. And satisfying God on your behalf. Even though you cannot see the blood, you can believe in its effectiveness. This blood, blood sh solves your problems toward God. If God esteems the blood of Christ sufficient to remove your sins, can you do the same? Or do you require some good feeling besides? Can your requirements be higher than God's? No. You must simply confess, Oh God, thank you that you, the blood of Christ has taken away all my sins. If you are happy with the blood, then I am happy also. Amen. I just wanted to share that with you. 
in case some of you are, you know, thinking that, you know, your sins are too great to be forgiven and washed away by his blood. They're not. Anyways, saints, brothers and sisters, everybody, praise the Lord. I just wanted to read that to you. I hope you enjoyed it. We are still on chapter 3. Um, we'll be um, Saturday um, on the guilt in your conscience. <laughs> Anyways, I have a feeling that this is above 10 minutes. I hope you enjoyed um, what I read a little bit. I'll talk to you later. Bye.